Hey guys, it's Tyler, one of the mentors here at CG Spectrum, and I'd like to welcome you to another live stream. So thank you for joining me today. I hope you're having a wonderful week. I hope it's a great day where you are, and uh, things are going pretty good over here. And we've got some fun things to look at on the stream today. It'll be kind of a course preview, actually. Uh, that was uh, my thought here. I think that might be cool to uh, share with everybody little preview into one of the assignments that you would get if you were to go into our intro to concept art program. So the way things work here at CGS is when you sign up, you're going to be given access to our videos that we create, uh, very high quality content from our mentors, walking you through all these different modules, uh, teaching you all these critical things to uh, get you all prepared for being a concept artist. And one of the first assignments that we present to you is this challenge of designing an evil book, which I think is a really, really fun assignment. And um, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just kind of take a stab at that here and um, show you how I might take on an assignment like that. So without further ado, let's try our hand at designing an evil book, shall we? Okay, so we're here in Photoshop and we're not doing anything fancy here. We just got a simple blank canvas going on, eight and a half by 11, 300 DPI. And I always like to start out with just rough sketches, right? We wanna be thinking about things broadly first. Don't get caught up in the details. Just think about the big shapes, the envelopes, and a book is essentially a box, right? So let's think about just drawing a box first, get a box feeling good, and then we can start layering on some of those details. So let's do that, shall we? And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, heck, a box. Nothing really to it, right? And I present to you one thing to consider. Take a look at these two options we've got here. Let's draw, let's draw a little bit of a side to this. They're both boxes, right? But they feel different. One has a kind of a dynamic quality to it, and the other one is a little bit more static. Why is that? Well, that's because this first one here has a bit more foreshortening, a little more dramatic perspective on this first one. And the second one here is more static because it is more uh, orthographic or has a more of a schematic sort of uh, perspective on it. We don't have as much tapering going on, right? So even in just drawing the box for our book, we immediately have something like this to consider. And this essentially gets into the idea of perspective, uh, which the course also covers. Uh, but I wanted to just talk real quickly about that. You know, when we're setting up a prop like this, just take a moment to think about, you know, how do I want this box to be uh, in space? Do I want it to feel like it's really dramatic like this? Or am I okay with more of a sort of schematic view? When we're doing concept art, we, we want to favor clarity over drama, typically, um, especially when we're showing off a, a, an object, a design for an object or a character. Um, and so we don't want to go too dramatic, too crazy with the perspective, because then we might be hiding things or it might be difficult for us to interpret the shapes. Um, but we can throw in a little bit, and it's going to give an extra bit of punch to the design that uh, a pure orthographic sort of drawing might not have. So typically I, I try to find a nice sort of middle ground between the two. So let's just erase this now that we've talked through it. And I'll start to think about that. And I'm not super concerned about precise lines at this stage. I'm just keeping it loose. And I'm thinking about what might the thickness of my book be? Do I want it to be a really thick book? Thinner book? Is it hard bound or is, does it have a soft cover on it? And I think for this book here, this wants to be a kind of an impressive book, a, a, a grimoire or a tome of sorts. And so I think it might be natural to uh, assume we want something that has a little bit of a, an epic thickness to it implying that it contains lots of hidden 
and I guess evil in this case, information. Hey, Penny, Tony, Audrey, Bear, awesome to see you guys. Thanks for joining me. And you probably all know this assignment, right? You've all gone through a lot of students here in the chat with me. And you're like, see, look at this. Now he's, now he's got to do the same thing we had to do. But uh, yeah, we were talking, uh, the mentors were talking about trying to maybe show a little bit more of a preview of what the school is like. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just do the very first assignment and uh, that might be kind of neat. And you'll see. Uh, a little bit of a um, an emphasis on that, I think, in the content overall, but we're still kind of working on it. This is just my kind of own stab at it, spur of the moment. So, you know, we're taking some time here and just getting this box to feel good. Basically just a box, right? Let's flip it horizontally. Remember, we can flip horizontally in Photoshop with a hotkey. I suggest setting it to something that's really easy for you to hit there, because when we flip, we can see if anything's feeling a little weird, if we have any uh, symmetry issues, all that sort of good stuff. Okay, and I feel like that's a pretty good sort of baseline for the book shape I'm thinking of here. Yeah, I don't mind that. And I'm going to copy this. We're going to move it over here as our blank, so that way if we get a little too crazy with this one and we want to start with another blank book to try another design out and we have that available but one of the things that i thought might be cool here is trying to integrate uh both metal aspects and also some fleshy aspects i think that tends to feel pretty creepy and evil uh, and so i think it might be nice to have an opportunity to show both of those materials So let's play around with that. I'm going to draw myself a little center line here. Let's get to be aware of where that center line is. Hey, Lewis, welcome in.
And so this is going to feel like chicken scratch, right? But this is the roughest stage, and we're not worried about how clean these lines are. This is just for you to brainstorm. Hello, screeching pigeons. I am doing well. Thank you for asking. That brings back some nostalgia. I'm sure it does if you're far along, definitely. Hey, Power Peach. Uh, so this is uh, this is sort of a preview of one of the first assignments students get for the uh, Intro to Concept Art course here at CGS. So I'm kind of like stepping in the shoes of the student for a moment here and showing how I might tackle a similar subject matter here. Uh, it's a pretty fun assignment, I think, overall.
uh, DMS because it's got a skull. Uh, well, there's going to be a skull-like quality to it for sure. Hopefully you'll see soon kind of what I'm what I'm thinking here. And these early stages, this tends to look like chicken scratch, but it's really just me kind of preparing myself for where I'm headed with this idea. And when you're not trying to do a, a live stream, I recommend doing a few different iterations, right? Doing some thumbnails and playing around with different ideas. And uh, I may do that. We'll see how I'm feeling about this design. I don't want to uh, spend too long on stream iterating, but yeah, it's definitely a good habit to get into there. So I think I've got a rough idea of where I want to go with this. And so what we can do now is we can drop the opacity back on this thing and do more refined line pass on it. This is uh, what I call an like iterative refinement where we're not trying to do the cleanest lines first. That would uh, not be a good strategy, right? That would result in us having a very kind of stiff design. We may not have thought about the big shapes. Um, you know, not just better to start rough and then refine, right? So we're going to do a loose pass, then we're going to lower the opacity down. And now we have this little template that we can work from and we can get in here and we can be way more careful about these lines and, and more detailed as well.
Hey, Rendani, welcome. Uh, yes, yes, I've been working in video games for about 13 years now. And uh, I'm a mentor for the CD Spectrum College of Digital Arts and Animation. So that's kind of what we're, we're doing here right now is we're showing one of the first assignments you would get as an intro student to our concept art course. Uh, Martin, if you want some more information, I encourage you, you can go over to my website where I've got a list of all of the uh, clients that I've worked for. It's uh, artoftie.com. You just scroll down and there's a, a huge, uh, huge list of, of uh, clients down there on the site you can check out. if your underdrawing is throwing off your sense of symmetry, it's good to just erase a bit of it. I actually think what I had there was pretty reasonable. What I'm looking for right now is I'm looking for... We've got... wants to line up
create little little symmetry puzzles for myself. It's always something good to practice. Denny asks, how many years does it take to reach your level and surpass it? Well, it kind of just depends on how much time you spend practicing. Um, you know, there's there's people who can uh, you know, really apply themselves, and I see a lot of progress very quickly. Um, you know, the... Um, you you kind of know, like, if you look at kind of like an improvement graph, you kind of get one of these kind of things going on, right, where you see a lot of improvement at the beginning very quickly um and then as you get further along the climb maybe starts to get a little bit or it feels like it's a bit slower just as you get into some of the further reaches um at least that's been my experience uh which is really encouraging for people who want to get into the field right because if they apply themselves they see huge uh huge quality leaps very very quickly um and I definitely see that with students all the time. Okay, this nail just wants to get adjusted. That's looking a little funky. Let's tweak that there. Cool. And let's bring in a sense of these lower teeth now. Uh, I'm going to save my work here and make sure we don't lose anything. If you're working on something right now, remember to save. Save often. Oh, thank you, Mohammed. Really appreciate that. Okay, cool. Let's see. Keep working on this fleshy part here. This will be... I mean, there's going to be a lot of fun things to render here. I'm thinking this top part is going to be uh, maybe kind of like a dark iron quality. And then this bottom will be, of course, all grotesque and fleshy. And we'll have all kinds of fun, fun colors going on there as well. But I kind of like the idea here that... Uh, you know, unlocking the book is not only unlocking the pages within, but is also somehow setting the this uh, creature free, you know, whatever this entity is. Um, I guess kind of a double whammy there. That's kind of fun. Um, you know, and this lock maybe feels a little bit vanilla. I think we'll, we'll tinker with that before we move into rendering here. But I wanted to get the, the functional aspect of it together first, and then we can we can dress it up a bit. And of course, this fleshy part can have a little bit of dangly bits. Because <laughs> why not?
whenever I put shadow into the drawing like this, uh, I tend to try to put it in places that are, well, if, if I haven't picked the lighting direction yet, uh, then I'll try to just put them in places where it's going to be pretty clear that there might be shadows, like areas of ambient seclusion, essentially, which is, if you guys don't know that term, that's basically when you have all of the kind of cracks and crevices where all the ambient light in the scene can't get to. Those are the darkest parts of the image, and those are pretty safe places to have some indication of darkness in your sketch because they will translate through to your render. You know, and if not, it's easy to tinker with that stuff. And this detail will all get quite gnarly once we start rendering this thing, but I'm just giving myself a indication of where I think it's going to head. And what you can see here is if we turn this layer off here, you can see how we progress from stage one to stage two, right? This was super loose and, um, you know, not something you'd share with a client, right? Like for those of you watching, you were looking at this and thinking, well, I kind of have a sense of where He's going kind of, but you weren't as clear. And now that we're into this phase, okay, now you're seeing a little bit clearer idea of where we're headed. Um, and it's it's this stage here that I would feel more comfortable sharing with the client, um, depending on the client. If you're working with a client who um, is maybe not an artist, right? Maybe somebody who's just a director or a writer or something, you may want to send them something that's just a little bit more refined. Um, if you're working with somebody who you think can interpret a sketch, um, an art director or something like that, then you could send them something a bit looser. Uh, so just consider that a bit when you're when you're sharing work with the clients. Uh, but always good to be sharing this kind of stuff because uh, you know it, it helps you kind of get both on the same page, um, and then there are no kind of surprises at the end. <laughs> And there's a curvature that's happening here, which is a little hard to indicate in the sketch. I'll just put a little hatching there to help me remember that that's going to be kind of bending up in the render. I mean, this this angle here shows it, but this area just feels a little nebulous. So you throw in a little bit of hatching to help uh, yourself see the, the form change there. And there'll, of course, be quite a bit of shadow happening in here. I don't want to get carried away with that just yet. We will get there. You're welcome, Zane. Oh, the, um, yeah, that piece with all the bounty hunters, uh, that was a fun piece. That was fun, fun. Um, one of the challenges with doing that piece was the fact that, um, that, uh, it, it featured all the bounty hunters in that scene and featured them at an angle that was, uh, not necessarily clear from the film, all of the details. So, I had to look, actually looked at the old uh, 80s action figures of those characters, and I was, it was hard finding the pictures of those figures at the right angle to see some of those details. Um, and luckily I was able to find ones that showed me showed me some of that stuff, like Forlom, the the um, <clears throat> the sort of rear, rear angle of Forlom that I had in the image there was one of those that was hard to... Um, 
know what shapes were happening. So that was the action figure helped tremendously in, in getting those details on there. So we've got this uh, dual material thing for the cover. And so the question is, what are we doing for the back cover? We're not going to see really much of it at all, but we see the edge. And so the question is, do we continue the theme on the back half here? Do we show this kind of metal on here and then this fleshy? I think that's probably a good idea. This helps the viewer understand more clearly the, uh, the design motif. So, you know, again, we don't really have an opportunity to show too much of it here, but we'll use some rounded shapes and the colors, of course, will help too later, but we'll use these kind of rounded soft forms as opposed to these rigid forms here to indicate that, yeah, this is kind of a fleshy, leathery thing going on down here. I'm not going to worry too much about the page details in the line phase because it's something that I'm going to be able to imply very easily once we're rendering this. If I go in here and I draw a bunch of lines and stuff, that's just going to get overridden as I'm rendering. So there's no major forms happening in here. And if there are, it's something easy we can add later. But I won't put an indication of some binding details here. Uh, there'll probably be some embellishments that happen at the end as well. I'm thinking possibly some carvings in the metal here, some evil looking writing or something, some magical sigils of sorts. Yeah, let's take a look at this log here. Is there any way we can maybe fancy this up a bit? And there's a bit of a design language that we've established already with the cover of the book here. We have this kind of, um, well, it's almost like a deco style uh, paneled metal quality going on. And so, you know, it would be weird, uh, well, unless there was a narrative reason specifically why the lock was of a different origin. Again, that, that sort of makes the design harder for the audience to interpret. Uh, we want to kind of mirror the design language established here in the lock. So I don't want to put, for example, like, you know, some like Celtic swirls or something around the edges, right? That would be really kind of weird. Um, so, you know, maybe we kind of mirror that, um, those metal panels in some kind of way. Do we do like a, Kind of a split like that could be interesting. Do we do some kind of pattern like this, right? Maybe all kinds of different possibilities here. lock had a similar shape to the head. If it was more rounded, that kind of like... No, it doesn't read as immediately as a lock. <clears throat> Let 
Okay, those corner bevels I think help it a bit. That's that's a nice addition. This keeps it. It makes it a little more interesting than it being a pure rectangular lock. And then we've got this little extra division there in the, uh, the middle area. See, so yeah, I think overall that's it's working pretty good. Okay, let's uh, flip our art here and just see, uh, have we been blind to any obvious I issues? <laughs> and nothing screaming out at me. You know, there's some refinement, but I don't think there's anything that's uh, screaming out as being problematic at this stage. I think, if anything, we might take this assembly here and... Apply a little extra perspective warp to it. Let's see, we'll get this a little bit down. Yeah, ever so slightly. And I think that this tongue feels like it might need to be down slightly for it to feel like it's hitting the, the ground or the tabletop or whatever it is that this thing is sitting on. Corner feels a little bit low. And we're definitely going to want some nice kind of raggedy stuff going on on the back side here of these pages. That'll be a super fun aspect of the silhouette there. <clears throat> because detail and stuff here will be cool looking, but it's not as impactful as the stuff that actually affects the silhouette. So that's, this edge is going to be just slightly more important than this edge, but then we'll want continuity between them. So it'll happen here too. Hopefully that makes sense. And um, this is a concept, right? So this is not supposed to be designed for just one angle. It's likely wherever this is going to go in whatever imaginary content we can imagine. This is landing in a book or a movie or, um, or no, sorry, not a book. Um, thinking of a book because I'm drawing a book, a movie or, uh, you know, a TV show or a game. Uh, we're going to see it at different angles. Um, so, you know, and you may want to draw other angles of this to help those working on it. Maybe they're going to need to model it out. They might need to see other views. If there's not the spine, you could have a breakout drawing over here of the other side of the book. Right now we could show the details happening on the, on the spine there. Those are all things that are important to consider. Okay, let's, uh, let's flip this back around here. And I use my layers not only to stay organized, but also as a history state. So before we move to the next major step here, I'll just put all these layers into a group here called one duplicate that down and now we're on group two and if I ever needed to I could go back to where we were in stage one <clears throat> but I can move forward with confidence now merging things and and you know smudging things and doing whatever I need to do so we'll get rid of that temporary book there we can scale this bigger now that we have a need for more resolution and I'll consider the cropping here. Let's see, I think we can change our format slightly. And funny enough, I didn't dirty up my canvas. You guys will know I usually like to give myself a little bit of texture here so I'm not as rigid when I'm working on stuff. Just having a little fun with some textures there. You know, spill some coffee on your paper. Make it feel less precious. More approachable. And like you can make mistakes and it's not a big deal. Okay, so I'm going to take these two layers. We had our underdrawing um, and our overdrawing. And there's some interesting kind of little tonal bits of information in that underdrawing that I kind of want to have in there. Uh, I'll erase a couple of these parts so that feel 
bit egregious things that pop to our new design but there's some fun little weird things happening in there that you know who cares right we're going to be rendering it right now so let's merge all that together and we can start thinking about this render <laughs> you didn't think to add a complete head to the book. Well, I'm glad you liked the idea. Um, yeah, I thought that might be kind of neat to just go the full the full distance. Definitely makes it kind of creepy, right? We have an opportunity to do some, some fun organic details in there. Um, okay, so now what do we do? What's the next step here in terms of rendering? Well, everybody's got their own way. Um, and for me, I like to... Uh, think about shadows first and highlights later uh, and the reason that I like to do that is because <laughs> my students will be like oh boy here's this, this lecture again I, I repeat the same things over and over because you have to hear them many times for them to really sink in right well in addition to actually practicing them but uh, I like to do shadows first because shadows are, are basically kind of material agnostic right you don't really have to be thinking about too much anyway the specific materials that are happening, whereas the, the highlights, or what people call highlights, which are basically specular reflections, um, those are very specific to the kinds of materials that are there. And I want my, my, my brain space to be fully devoted to the material specificity when I'm doing that phase, right? I don't want to be thinking about where the light is and the shadow shapes and all that stuff. So I like to kind of separate things into different stages that require my brain to be thinking about different things. I like to kind of focus it uh, on, on those important few steps at each, at each phase. Hopefully that makes sense. So in the shadow phase, what we're worried about is the direction of the light, sculpting the forms, and having a consistent sense of, of direction to the light uh, with the way that we're, we're creating those shadows. Uh, and then we're not worried about, is this metal, is this leather? You know, we're not as worried about that right now. Okay, so as a recap of something from an earlier video, I guess it's a pretty old video at this point. Time flies, doesn't it? But uh, shadow types, there are three shadow types. So we've got ambient occlusion, we've got form shadows, and we've got cast shadows. Those are the three kinds of shadow types. And... I like to do the ambient occlusion first because I do a bit of a kind of like a um, an enhanced ambient occlusion pass where I go a little further. I, I sculpt some of the with the ambient occlusion shadows than you might do in a strictly ambient occlusion pass. Um, yeah, because I think it just helps me kind of solve some of the some of the form choices I'm making. I like to paint like I'm sculpting. It's really really helpful for me to feel the volumes and, and resolve those design to those more nuanced design choices. So that's going to be the first pass here. And then we'll do the form and cast shadows on the second pass. So let's figure out where the light's coming from at this point. That's a good thing to know. And I think again, with concept art, we want to favor clarity over drama. So we don't want to choose lighting. That's going to mask most of the details in this book, right? If we chose you know, that the whole front of the book is in darkness and there's just a little bit of spooky green light from the back here. Well, that might look really cool and scary, but is it helping us understand the design? No, not really. So as much as you might want to do that, just remember what is the purpose of the art? If it's a piece of concept art, you know, then you need to kind of ensure that there's enough clarity. So typically you're going to want to have a key light that's hitting the dominant side of the form here, which is, you know, this, this side over here. And so for that reason, I'm going to have my light in the scene over here and I'll just do a little uh, little sun there so we can be reminded of that uh, the direction of that light there okay and <coughs> excuse me now we're gonna do a new layer it's gonna be our ambient occlusion pass and um, no, you know, we're just going to do it as one layer here. I'm going to, I'm going to do it right with the line art. I'm going to have the line art sort of become the ambient occlusion pass so I can start to meld things together. Okay. Let's see. Go to a good brush for this situation here. Let's 
see what eraser I'm on. And it's important to know in this in these shadow passes that I'm working with pure black. I'm not worried about picking gray values. I, I eliminate that. I just use the transparency of my brush to control how light or dark things are. So if you want something, if you want a darker value, then push harder, right? If you want a lighter value, push lighter. And there's, again, there's no one right way to do this. It's just the way that I like to do it. So I'm doing ambient occlusion here and I'm just form sculpting a bit. Help me understand some of these things. Let's do, let's do this brush here. Pretty safe to go uh, further with this AO pass if you know where your light's coming from. If you don't know where your light's coming from, then you know it might create some weird conflicts when you decide where the light is. So I find it good to just determine the light source before you do any of the shadows. we're working on the line layer here we're going to get a more painterly result because as we're working on these shadows we're starting to kind of eliminate those lines Oh, thanks, Alan. And make a death vibes nice. Yeah, I guess that would be an appropriate uh, sort of playlist for this this theme too, right? We got some chill vibes, but I think some uh, some metal would also be appropriate here. <laughs> Put a little bit more, more shadow over here. Again, this is where I'm allowing myself freedom to sculpt.
that thing makes you think of a bookmark awesome awesome that was definitely some uh subliminal messaging coming through i think successfully And the, the hope with creating all of these separate passes that you allow yourself to be a bit relaxed at each phase, right? You're not getting overly worried or concerned or anxious about anything. In each phase, you have a very clear goal. Um, and the steps that you did before this stage set you up so that you don't have a lot of big questions in your mind. You know what I mean? That's That's the hope anyway. Uh, do I find with digital work I have to slow myself down? That's an interesting thought. Yeah, I guess that's probably true. Uh, the digital format does feel like it has a lot of freedom. I do like working fast, I will say. Um, because no matter how fast I work, it still seems like it's kind of slow. And that's because I'm such a... Uh, you know, a, a detail-oriented person, I guess, is the way to put it. Um, and so I like to get in, like, this is, um, you know, just now we're starting to maybe see some of the details that I was hoping for come to life in the horse. But yeah, I mean, I just enjoy being able to make progress quickly because I'm seeing it in my head already with so much of this information. But I think that the, the thing about um, the speed comment is uh, if you find that you're putting down a lot of lines that you're then having to erase, um, 
you know, then you may, may not be thinking enough about the marks before you're putting them down. Try giving each mark a little bit more contemplation before you add it in. even after I've drawn the design out. I like to flip because it's going to give us a different sense of the lighting too. You might catch certain things about the lighting that are not feeling quite right. And I think what I might do here is I'm going to see show the backdrop. We just want layer zero here. And just with liquify, we're using liquify tool here. I'm going to bend this plate just a bit more severely there. Um, let's see, anything else I want to do? front nail here it's feeling a little bit fat Let's squeeze that in a bit Let me tilt that out just a bit more get it poking up okay cool that again so yeah that's a really helpful tool subtle little tweaks here and there So you guys can see what I mean by AO plus enhanced, AO enhanced, because this is quite extensive for ambient occlusion. But again, I like to use this opportunity to kind of sculpt forms and express some of the nuances that I was not able to maybe get or I didn't want to get in the line art.
and where you don't think you can integrate some of that line work from before, then just erase it. I think I like that split element going all the way down there. That's fun. And I want badly to put shadow underneath this, but I'm going to leave the uh, to the surface below till a uh, little bit later. Keep it constrained to the object for now. Uh, let's see, how do I handle moving your ambient occlusion brush preset? I have a hard time figuring out which direction to swipe in order to cast the shadow. Also, do I have an alternate method besides that brush you think will do the trick? Sure, that's a good question. Um, yeah, th these brushes that uh, rely on direction are tricky uh, to get uh, a handle on. Um, you know, and unfortunately, they are definitely the best to, um, to putting in. It's like those ambient occlusion shadows because you're you're having basically a, a a hard edge for the origin points and then a fall off away from that origin point and so the only other way i could say you might be able to do it is to use your your lasso tool you could free lasso an area and then use a soft brush just go in right with the soft brush here and just paint from outside the edge right kind of smoke it in that way you have that hard edge and the gradation. It's a little slower. In fact, it might be a lot slower, but you wouldn't have to be as worried about uh, getting used to this this whole situation because it's either this brush here or the, my knife brush are the two that I use. Um, the knife brush is a little bit more of a flat uh, expression of that. The, the AO brush is just a little bit more of a um, clean gradient there, a little more uh, obvious gradation. 
the <clears throat> the knife brush is like, I think a really nice balance between the AO brush and the square brush. So just so you guys know, the square brush is, you know, this one here. AO brush is this one here. And then the knife brush is this one here. So you can see it's kind of a combination of the two there. This song reminds me of that game Luminous, kind of an old game on, uh, it was originally on Sony PSP back in the day, like a kind of a Tetris style game. That's some cool music though. You played that one, Zane? Yeah, I love that game. That was a really fun one. Yeah, this face is like, you know, melting into the cover or whatever. We don't really have to be. A lot is too logical about it. If we can show the flesh blending, then that's enough for the viewer to understand that they're combining together. bottom cover here.
Okay, the edge is feeling maybe a little thick, so let's, uh... Try and... Define that a little bit more clearly there. Okay, cool.
Oh, thanks, Tony. I think it's definitely starting to take shape here. It's both super cool and extremely painful. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, definitely see where you're coming from on that. There, I just duplicated the AO layer and lowered it way down just to kind of enhance everything, a bit darken everything that we've done. And we'll be going further with uh, the polish and the details here and all that stuff, but I want to play around with our graphic lighting pass here. So this is going to be... Uh, Bit more directional looking lighting to see how that might look in the scene here so i'm gonna do this as a 50 percent opacity layer flat brush set to black now we're just going to carve some really graphical shapes into this book here thinking about it again this is our light direction up here Let's present those shadows. And just look at it from far away and see, does that make sense? Is it looking like we're uh, conveying the lighting? In a cohesive way. Yeah, 
And this, so the, the, the sort of unfortunate thing about putting a little light in here like this is it's fairly flat. It doesn't give us a sense of how much in front it is um, on the book here. And so that that's requires a little bit of just you thinking about that. And I imagine the light is actually not as far behind as it feels here, right? The light is a little bit more kind of in front of us shining onto the book. So, you know, that might be something worth changing a bit here is having this this casting a little bit more this way. I was just realizing I was getting paying too much attention to that uh, <laughs> that abstract sun there. So just be careful about that. Think about the rotation of the light in your scene. how much from above it is too. If it's lower in the scene, you'll get these things casting further away. And I like to try to keep these shapes as simple as possible simpler these shapes are, the better the readability will be of your, of your piece. find funny about this pass is that things about the lighting direction that might have seemed obvious to you in your head when you start putting in these shapes you realize wait a minute that, the direction of that is actually a little bit different than what I was thinking it might be or the way that that shape expresses it's a little bit different so let's see I think what we'll want to do here I'm just trying to think about the shadow stuff happening here and the book is fairly flat we're gonna have some shadow casting off this here. I think we're gonna have light hitting this, this area here. I wanna show maybe the light starts to emerge here. And then there'll be some little bit of weirdness in the shadow shape there from the way that those strands are kind of pulling. But that's kind of where I'm thinking that wants to be. Here's where we're doing some uh, some readability checks here to see how things are feeling.
And so we can see here now I can adjust this, the strength of that layer to control how light or dark it is. So we can go like crazy comic book mode and we can crank it all the way up. But the, the strength of this layer is based on how much ambient light is in the scene. So you want to figure out at this point, you know, is this going to be a darker scene, a lighter scene? Um, I mean, actually, you don't have to make that choice right now because this is its own layer. You can adjust it easily, but um, we'll think about it a little bit here. And I think, you know, we're probably going to have kind of a mid-tone-y scene. So maybe something in that range there. And everything has a hard edge on it right now, which is not natural. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch over and go to our smudge tool and we're going to just identify you know which shadows were um which shadows are cast shadows which ones are form shadows the form shadows are going to get softened cast shadows are going to stay mostly hard edged soften them add about a bit there Yeah, we don't really need to do a whole lot of work in this pass. It's nice when your shadows have some uh, variation in edge quality. The edge quality being different is one of the things that's going to add a nice uh, element of realism and interest to the piece overall. Uh, you hope you can see it in color? Oh, absolutely. This will be a full render um, so what I want to do is let's fill in the whole book shape now so we have a mask to work with and then we can use that to constrain some of our colors I'm gonna put these in a group called shadows that was our sunlight there let's just delete that layer it's kind of a distraction at this point and I'll erase away our notes so this is us in an attempt to try and immerse ourselves more fully in our scene, right? Get rid of the things that are making it more difficult to do that. And this will be the beginning of our flats layer. And it doesn't matter what color we're using here, right? This is just to fill in the shape. So don't pay attention. This is not going to be an indication of what it will actually be. Um, I'm just going to pick something random, like, you know, let's just, let's just go with something like a brown tone for now doesn't really matter. And you know, we could actually let's um Let's reduce redundancy here. Let's just actually fill in the region specifically. We think we're going to be different colors. So let's let's just do that. Let's just dive right into that now that I'm thinking more about it. Um, so we'll do all of these, all these metal bits here will be a thing. So I didn't really need to undo that. I could have just shifted the color, but no, oh, that was a quick recovery. I think I want these rivets to be, while they might end up being the same color as the metal around it, I want the opportunity to change my mind or shift that independently. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that separately here. Oh boy, look at that. We did a a little boo-boo there with that uh, AO pass. No gray values in our shadow pass. That will mess up our, our process here. So just be careful about that. Hopefully we won't uncover too many of those. I'm usually pretty good about it, but definitely happens. Oh, and if you're uh, ever wondering, good use of the color palette here. This is a good use right here. Get rid of all this nonsense. Cool. So we can grab this again easily if we end up needing to select some other colors. 
can go back to that one very quickly. The sampling with the shadow visible here is going to give us a darker color, and we don't want that. We want the original color. So rather than having to turn off that shadow layer to sample, we can just grab it from that palette right there. Contemplating whether I want this, uh, I think I want that metal piece to be the same, yeah. Oh boy, a couple other gray spots here. No worries, no worries, we'll work around that, let's see. Sometimes when you're just kind of sampling things and you end up grabbing a gray value instead. I could just set the layer to multiplier and that would fix it too, but uh, when I go to colorize later, it's going to... If I colorize the shadows, it's going to start to do some weird stuff, so... I don't want it... This whole thing is going to be this blue color, isn't it? Yeah, I'm realizing that now. Okay. Cool. Don't have to worry about all those edges. And my initial thought on this color is it's not quite the color I'm going to go with, but I think I'm going to go with either a neutral gray or a cooler gray because this fleshy stuff is going to be on the warmer side.
So for each region, let's have a new layer. And uh, let's do the pages. So I'm gonna select this blue stuff we've got, select the inverse and mask that off so that I don't have to worry about overlapping any of the stuff we've already painted. New layer. Again, select what we've already got. Select the inverse and mask. Let's go for some fleshy stuff going on now. certainly changed my mind about these colors but again this is just a starting point to get the shape or the uh the region locked in because of course the other thing we're going to do is we're going to add color variation right we don't want everything to just be a single color don't feel like a coloring book or something that's not what we want could do a separate layer for the gums, but I think I'd rather just sort of color shift or, or smoke in some of that redder tone or pinker tone into this flesh layer. So, you know, just kind of, just kind of think about like how, to what degree you want these changes to be, uh, how different you want the regions to be. If they're similar, for example, if you're doing like a person's face and you're going to have some rosiness in their cheeks or their nose, you know, you're not going to put a separate color region for those areas, right? That's a very soft transition. So I guess that's the best way to think about it is, is it a hard or a soft transition and then uh, group accordingly? started talking about special effects yet, right? Definitely going to need some special effects in this. That's at the very end though, right? That's like the, that's the icing on top. That's the cherry on top of the sundae. Save that for the end. Looked in, really getting a sense now of that uh, 
those design choices that we made on materials. So we're approaching the end here, but I'm going to probably go just a little bit over because I want to get all of the flat colors or the flat regions blocked in before we end this particular video. That way, when we start the next video, we're going to be moving right into establishing all of the final colors, tinting the shadows, and moving into the final render pass on this thing, which will be a lot of fun. A two thirds. Yeah, let's just say that's flesh for now, and then maybe we can change our mind later about it. Certainly allowing some freedom to play around and tweak details when we get to the final pass here. Okay, flesh is going to wrap around the edge here. Whoops. Got a little carried away. Okay. And then this binding element here, I think I'm going to have something a little bit differently colored for that spot. It's like some stitching, right, that fuses it all together. What's the point of staying within the lines anyway? <laughs> it's too funny. Honestly, um, it's one of the joys of concept art is that it doesn't necessarily have to be like a CAD drawing, you know? <laughs> something I greatly appreciate. Uh, let's see, maybe something a little bit warmer for this, uh, this binding here. And, you know, I think we'll just include the inner mouth with that color because I like that pink, pinky tone there. Yeah.
Okay, so for these pins here, I'm thinking those are going to be more of a warm, warm toned metal. Uh, let's redo that here. Select inverse, mask, the tone. There we go. And right now it's the same color as the pages. I'm going to shift the, uh, I'm going to shift the pages to be a little bit warmer. Okay. Pages. Oops. Oh, actually. See, this is the fun part, right, where we start playing around with these, uh... Let's go a little lighter with the pages there. Yeah, that's good. And so the teeth, we gotta do the teeth. Let's do that. I'm going to do something a bit unexpected with those. I think I'm going to make them look metallic. So we'll go with something a bit darker there. And in fact, that might be something cool to do with the stitches as well. Maybe they're, um, maybe they're also metal metal stitches instead of red stitches. I think that just feels a little more brutal, which I think is kind of the vibe we're trying to get with this thing overall, so. Let's do that. Just, we're gonna hack this and put that right there. There we go. some of these uh, extra bits that we have here. Just little artifacts. So now we can control the scene brightness because we have all of the lats blocked in. So we can do a darker scene like this and then increase our shadow intensity, make that a bit darker. See, now we start to get pretty moody, right? It starts to become a lot more of a moody scene and we can lower the lightness of all of our flats as well. If we just stick a hue sat adjustment layer on top of the flats and link it. But let's see, hopefully it didn't crash things here. Sometimes. Save our save our document here. I get sense when Photoshop's getting a little squirrely on me, and I it makes me nervous. <laughs> to Simmons evil spirits nice I got your kiss joke I totally did party every day right okay 
think we're clear to adjust now. So we'll go here and uh, so see we can control the lightness of our uh, of our flats as well, so that we can create a dimmer scene if we want to. Right, it's less light hitting that stuff. This is where we get into problems. See where I was using the um, the gray values on this uh, this area here. We gotta try to clean that up a little bit. We got a little sloppy there. No worries. But what I wanted to show you guys real quick before we go here is. Um, What's going on with that there? There's some weird artifact on a skin layer, is it? <laughs> Where is that? Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, well, let's fix that a little, little blip there. Oh, oh, bizarre! It's in the uh, it's in the mask for the hue sat layer. That was weird. Okay. <laughs> mystery solved um so what i want to show you guys is um you know we've got this area that's going to be the fleshy part there and so what we can do is select that area and then apply a hue sat adjustment layer to our shadows group link it with the shadows group and then we can adjust and colorize and adjust the tonality of the shadows of that area right so we can give it a little bit of warmth and we don't want to go crazy with it, but we can, can inject a bit of that sort of subsurface scattering quality to it. And we can do that for different regions. Um, yeah, so that's something cool we can play with uh, for next time there. And we'll inject some uh, some color variation. Anyway, yeah, we got to, got some fun stuff to do for next time there. And I think it's in a pretty good spot. Again, we got some a couple little weird issues here and there with the uh, the AO pass, but those are uh, those are pretty easy to fix there. Let's see. I just want to get to this point, and it's like I'm ready to rock and roll on the next <laughs> on the next phase already, because um, I want so badly to uh, to start rendering this this next layer here, but. Uh, or unfortunately we're out of time. So what I hope is that you guys will come back for next time. And the other thing we can do too is we can color balance the whole flats layer to uh, give a sense of tinting to the uh, to the scene. So we could like kind of put a blue or a yellow cast on, on all of the flats right now. It would kind of simulate particular kind of lighting, you know, like maybe that you know, a little bit of that sort of warmer lighting on there could be cool. Right. So there's all kinds of stuff you can do when you have this setup like this, you have this organization, uh, you have a ton of power and that's, that's what I like. I like to have that level of control and power, um, because I can change things easily. Um, so yeah, uh, that is where we will end this session. Um, and again, this was sort of a preview of one of the first assignments that you will face uh, in the intro program to concept art here at CGS. I hope you enjoyed watching me put this book together. Again, we'll have, uh, I think, one more session next week where I complete uh, this book design, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for joining me, guys. And let me just check the chat here real quick before I head out and see if there's any last questions. Let's see. Uh, yeah, let's, um, definitely see if I can help you out with that, uh, AO brush a bit more there, Penny, because it's a little tricky. I agree. Uh, let's see. When do you continue with the streaming? Yeah. So it'll be next week, uh, at the exact same time. And thank you guys. Appreciate all the positive comments. Uh, really, really appreciate it. So, yep. I will catch you next week. Okay. See you then. Bye-bye.